All right, Steve, welcome to Bitcoin Builders. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on the show. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm super excited. Uh, you are someone who is sort of uh, a pre, <laughs> a, a well known, a prominent, and uh, and both uh, and behind the scenes and in front of the scenes Bitcoin builder. So I'm super excited to have you here to chat today. And I want to start just you know a classic podcast start with a little bit of your story, how you got into Bitcoin. Uh, you know, I think I think you have a particular vantage that's that's really interesting, especially to some of the folks who are maybe not as technical or aren't thinking about it from from that side. Yeah, I. Um... I spent um, a couple decades in the tech tech industry. Um, I was at Google from 2006 to 2015 as a product director, um, and then I I left I left Google, planning on doing a startup, uh, toyed with some some uh, ideas, and then in early, like January 2017, is was my moment of sort of going down the proverbial rabbit hole and just ever since then being fixated on cryptocurrency and specifically Bitcoin. Um, but my first introduction to Bitcoin was during the 2013 sort of wave of new people. Uh, I had friends at Google who pointed me to it. I read the white paper. Um, but honestly, at that point in time, um, fixing the money didn't resonate with me. Um mm -hmm. Life was good. I, I was, you know, having a good time at Google, um, and uh, and I just I didn't, you know, I, I did not appreciate the history of money, what act money actually is, and the the value of Bitcoin. I really only valued it at that point as like it's an interesting tech solution um, to 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 a problem. Um, but fast forward to 2017. Uh, I was, you know, I had both time and an open mind about what, what to do next. Um, and then interestingly, Ethereum is what got me motivated to study this, uh, this space more. Um, again, that was like early 2017. It was actually right before the market and prices really got crazy in 2017. But, but of course, that, um, that price movement also just you know, created questions for me. Like, is, you know, is this real or not? Like, what, why are people, is this purely a casino uh, and gambling or is there something real here? And so 2017 for me was the year of just learning, discovery. And I emerged from 2017 with a much deeper appreciation of money in general and actually gold. Um, I also didn't really understand gold that well. I had sort of a Warren Buffett view on <laughs> gold prior to that. Um, but a much deeper appreciation for Bitcoin specifically, and generally skeptical of almost everything else that was being um, developed or promoted at, at the time. So ever since 2017, I've just pretty much exclusively focused on on Bitcoin. Um, but then the next question for me was like, okay, I, I don't want to just like sit around and read about it or tweet about it. I want to I want to like help, you know. So I had, I had to figure out like how do I want to help? I do have a technical background. Um, Way back when I did code, but it had been you know I haven't professionally coded for a long, long time, um, and I you know I feel like my unique skill set is is around um, PMing, sort of be, being a non technical, non coding person who can help out with projects in a, a variety of ways. Um, so I went about thinking about you know how can I how can I help? So I I had never had experience with open source before, so I dug into the Bitcoin Core project specifically, but other open source projects. Um, and I, you know, I noticed this, like, this is during like segwit wars and things like that, block size wars. So I, I noticed this huge schism between companies, uh, in the space and open source developers. Um, so I went about like trying to understand that, um, why they weren't seeing eye, eye to eye, why there wasn't better communication and, and, and tried to help bridge that gap to some extent. Um, I met with some other folks who created an organization called Bitcoin Optech, uh, mm -hmm. which had sort of similar goals um, and really about like the communicating and make, creating awareness around the available scaling technologies for Bitcoin that um, that were already available, but were not being deployed yet by by companies. So um, I helped out with that. I got more immersed with the Bitcoin core project, um, which I'm actually going to do a Twitter spaces um, s soon. Uh, I don't know when you're going to publish this show, but you know maybe maybe prior to that. But just I'm actually trying to f um, solicit anyone who's interested in, in PMing the Bitcoin Core project because that was what 
I was set on doing. I put two years of my time into getting prepared to do that and have that impact. And then the um, the role at Square, now Block, uh, was created to lead Spiral. And, and that's what I've been doing the past almost four years now, is leading Spiral, which is a pure um, open source Bitcoin initiative within the company that, that we that the, the company itself doesn't tell us where to invest or what, what to do. Um, it's a really unique situation. So that's what I've been doing the last four years. And it, it, um, it meant I never, I, I did not keep following that path of, of working on, uh, on Bitcoin core, but I'm, but I am interested in finding someone else, uh, who, who would be interested in that or, or multiple people. Awesome. Yeah, I want to I want to come back to that uh, sort of more towards the end of this conversation because I think a lot of people are going to listen and be super excited. And you know, I always say that you know people's sense of the possible is shaped by what they see around them. And I think that a lot of folks just don't think about their ability to contribute to Bitcoin in that way. You know, so I think it's it's a it's a super cool thing that you're actively recruiting for it. Um, it it's interesting listening to you kind of chat about your trajectory with this. I feel like I had a very similar. Um, rock skipping off the pond kind of uh, interaction with Bitcoin in similar geographic place, similar kind of tech society. Like I remember when I was, you know, 2012, 2013, like Bitcoin was one of the logos on like the Koopa Cafe, you know, cash register of things that you could use alongside Square, ironically, given how things have evolved. But it was like, it was a competitor to Square. It's just this other kind of quirky payments thing that you could do to look cool when you were kind of pitching your, your company or whatever. Um, and it wasn't until uh, I, I really kind of like sat with it a few years later in 2017 as well that that it sort of hit for me. Um, let's talk about Spiral and that and that part of the journey. It is really unique to uh, be inside a company without having sort of a mandate other than to do you know to follow your nose basically and figure out kind of what's best for this for this other thing. Um, when you guys came into Spiral, like what were the early days like? You know, where where were you starting to look? Where were you? What were you curious about? And how quickly did you start to kind of hone in on you know what you guys are are working on now? Yeah, great question. Um, it, it really was the case. I, I think it was March of 2019. Jack Dorsey tweeted out saying, "Hey." We're going to start this new organization um, that is uh, going to be given a budget, hire three or four developers to just do whatever they feel is right for open source Bitcoin. Um, so it it was a pretty pretty unique endeavor, um, and I I really had no plans to go work for a company again. I you know Google was a fantastic experience, but I was kind of ready to just not not go back to a big tech company. Um, but this opportunity was exactly what I was already sort of planning. So one reason I was sort of well prepared for this, this type of organization and, and sort of knew, knew what I was hoping to, how, how I wanted to shape it was that I was already putting together an organization. I was calling it Bitcoin works and it very much was like, um, a chain code labs, which if any, anyone in the open source Bitcoin space is familiar with chain code labs, where it's just a group of like you know, six to 10 open source developers who, who can work, primarily work on Bitcoin Core, but can work on open source Bitcoin and have a lot of freedom. Um, you know, Blockstream and MIT DCI, other organizations have con contributed like that. And I wanted Bitcoin Works to be um, another a similar organization, but also with some differences. Um, I thought that like, like with Chain Code, they only hire full-time people and you have to live in New York, which is perfectly fine. But I, you know, my observation was that there is talent all over the world, um, you know, people interested in Bitcoin and, and specifically engineering talent all over the world that wanted to work on Bitcoin. So I, I felt like having a global footprint would be important. Um, and while engineering and developers is the most important thing, um, I, I felt like design, there's an omission with design too. No, no one was working on design and just in general, open source design doesn't really exist. Mm -hmm. uh, but I felt like there is a, a need there um, to develop like best practices for design in Bitcoin that could help the rest of the industry not be like a, a standard or dictating how to do it, but just sure. creating best practices and advice for others who are building a Bitcoin and, and create some cohesion um, throughout the ecosystem. Um, so I was already working on that, trying to raise funds. And then this, the, the, the spiral opportunity came along and I'm like, okay, great. Here's a company that has Two, two existing big businesses with Square and Cash App um, 
who has a CEO who, um, you know, you know, speaks like he's aligned with Bitcoin in the way that 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 I was. Uh, So this sounded like an amazing opportunity. So I'd I had already gotten to know um, Miles Suter and Mike Brock from Square through my work at Optech that I mentioned previously. Um, So I reached out to them, spoke with them, got an interview with with Jack. It was my first time meeting him. And, um, you know, I went into that, you know, obviously like letting him know why, why I thought it was a good fit for the job, but I wanted to, I wanted to learn from him. Like, is he actually authentic? D- does he really believe in Bitcoin the way he's like projecting publicly? And I came away, you know, like resoundingly yes from that. And, and, and now it's four years later and like nothing's wavered. So his, his, um, the alignment on like just what Bitcoin is and what it can be for the world w- was huge for me. And and I think it's why four years later, uh, he and the and the company have held true to their word. They are very hands off. Um, they are hands off uh, with Spiral and what we do, and um, and they've just been fantastic supporters for for what Spiral does. Amazing. So let's actually maybe zoom forward and and talk kind of like day to day right now. What are the biggest focuses for for Spiral? Yeah. Um, so, so the, 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 the plan that we created for Spiral um, was to really split the budget in two ways, hire a full-time team and then have a really strong, robust grant program. And mm-hmm. that's how we started it. And that's how it stayed consistently like that the whole time. Um, now, the full-time team, we decided to have uh, that team work as a team, similar to a commercial um, project. Uh, so, so like each developer doesn't have complete freedom on what they work on. We, we mm-hmm. chose one project and that was lightning development kit or LDK. Yep. Now that was not chosen by Jack. It wasn't chosen by me. Um, what I did, I went and, and hired four really great developers. Um, and the five of us collectively decided in the first three months or so, that, um, what we were going to, which project we we're going to work on. We explored many projects and lightning development kit is the one that sort of checked all the boxes and we've been working on that ever since. And it's it's really matured and really evolved. And um, I, I can speak to a little bit more detail about that in a, in a minute. Um, the other half of the, the budget is the grant program. And that's excellent because it really gives us amazing global reach. We're, we have, um, we've given out over 70 grants to over 40 people in over 20 countries. Um, approximately $3 million so far of grants have been um, uh, have, have been given out. So, um, it's, it's just a really, um, really strong, um, you know, program and every single grantee is a first time funded for open source Bitcoin development. So I think it's been successful in bringing new talent into the space. And we have something like 12 or 13 alum now from that program who have gone on to get full-time jobs at Bitcoin companies, start their own Bitcoin companies. So we have a really successful alumni program from the grant program as well now. And one more thing to note about the grant program, um, none of those grantees work on on LDK. They're working on other Bitcoin projects, uh, open source projects. So Bitcoin Core, we support um, several developers on Core, but also the Bitcoin development kit, the Bitcoin design community, we created, um, and all of these are, are community goods. They're all public projects that um, that Spiral does its, you know, Cy- Spiral sets them up so that Spiral or Block don't control them. Um, we want them to be public goods. And some projects have matured, like the Bitcoin design community, where it, you know, it can live on and sustain indefinitely, even if we went away. And we're trying to get other projects that we've kicked off in a similar position over time. How much, because uh, I'm sure there are going to be people who are listening who are now, you know, their brains are whirring with ideas. How much for the for those grant programs are, um, are you guys, you know, coming to the table with a, a set of things that you think would be interesting to have, you know, work on versus it just being a total blank page that people come in and say, hey, this is what's important. You know, is it, is it some combination of those two things or, you know, how does, how does that piece work? Yeah, I mean, that's a spectrum, but it's, it's, very close to the blank sheet of paper. Um, so like in our original post three years ago or so saying, hey, we have a grant program, we, we listed some examples, um, but we've never required that. Um, and aside from one grant, every single one has been what people have brought to us. 
And the one the one exception was Stratum V2, uh, which is a Bitcoin mining protocol, which helps decentralization of, of mining. Um, and we, we feel super passionate about that, you know, getting that implemented and getting it deployed. So um, no one was coming to us saying, hey, <laughs> we, we want to work on that. So we, we did you know, do an effort to, to find people. And, and that, that's, that's been, um, that was, you know, that was like two or three years ago. Uh, and that, that's now made tremendous progress, progress that, that project. Um, but every other grant has been, the grantee has told us what they want to work on, which I think is a really important, it, it makes it way harder to find people. Yep. <laughs> um, you know, cause not only, you know, find a, a talented person who, who knows how to develop software, or it has the skill set, but they also want to focus on open source Bitcoin, which often means they're quite mission driven that, you know, they feel yep. very passionate and it requires someone who knows how they want to impact Bitcoin and what project they want to work on. And then finally, we need to be convinced that they they're going to be their own boss. Like, you know, I'm, I'm not their manager. I, I don't wake yep. up and check in on them. They have to wake up every day and know what know what the next step is, get motivated to do the work and do, and do the work. And that's been so it is hard to find people like that, but we've done. I think we've done a good job finding those people. And, and every grantee at Spiral has just been, you know, been fantastic for Bitcoin. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, when when you get to work on exactly what you want to work on, have the freedom of time and location where you work, it's pretty pretty powerful. Yeah, I I, I agree. I think the mission orientation is is omnipresent, basically, in in. Uh, developers and and just builders in general in the space that I found, if, if for no other reason that there's there tends to, like these are some of the most in demand skill sets writ large in society today. You know, there's no shortage of things that you can go trade your talent for if you are uh, if you have that technical capacity. Um, I love. It sounds like the default is you know un- unless there is something that seems so valuable and important that it just happens to people not n- people happen to not be noticing it. Uh, you know, it's kind of the default is to let people come to to you guys with with their ideas yeah and i um i wouldn't i you know i wouldn't change that i think it's it was the right approach it's pr- it's proven itself the main drawback to that is that it it does um there's there's a lot of uh, people out there who who would be you know who are really yeah. talented developers into bitcoin but they just don't at least yet know what yeah. project they want to work on. So, so we're, we're missing out on, on, on those folks, but you know, that that's fine. I mean, they, you know, there's other opportunities for, 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 um, for folks in, the, in that situation. Totally. So I, I do want to dig now di- deeper into uh, lightning development kit. And, and I think what I'd love to do is try to use it almost as a way to kind of not just talk about uh, what you guys have been building, although I do want to want to get into that, but also sort of uh, use this as a way to introduce some of the folks who are, you know, in and around Bitcoin, who are, you know, are familiar with lightning, but haven't gone deep on it to kind of have a sense of, uh, you know, where where infrastructure capabilities are, how development has changed over the last little bit. You know, so I guess let's talk about where Lightning was when you started thinking about the Lightning development kit and, uh, and you know, what, what kind of prompted it initially? Yeah, there are a number of factors. Um, one is, I think, our, the, the Spiral team, uh, myself and the four original developers, and, and, and now we have seven, seven developers. Um, we all believe in Bitcoin as peer-to-peer money basically as stated in the original white paper. So um, I personally believe that the, I believe the digital gold narrative and, but I also believe Bitcoin is going to be the best money for people around the world to do, to do daily payments, to do internet payments, native currency, the internet. Uh, I think it'll be that as well as a great store of value. So I don't think those two are at odds with each other. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think they can both, they can both exist. Uh, and I think they both will exist in Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin is a store of value. I, I feel like that's, there's already like, the product's already basically done. I mean, of course we can improve security still and keep working at decentralization. And there's, there's really, you know, there's still important work to be done, but it's pretty much, it, you know, it already exists. But Bitcoin is a great payment um, system or, or, or great payment s- systems that allow you to use Bitcoin as money. They, they, they didn't exist with Satoshi's original code. Um, they didn't exist in 2013 when a lot of venture capitalists funded companies to, to you know, for Bitcoin as payments. And even today, it's get, gotten much better, but it still has a long ways to go. Um, and so um, Lightning is the best technology available today to enable that, um, specifically for non, non-custodial usage. 
uh, you know, if you're okay with custodial usage, um, or you know, or for for use cases and situations where custodial is acceptable or fine, we already know how to build those systems. And like things like Cash App or some future Venmo or Coinbase or other companies can create those payment systems. We know how to build those. Great UX, how to scale it, low fees. That's not hard. Non-custodial and where you get where you retain the values of Bitcoin, censorship mm-hmm. resistance. Um, and, um, uh, and, and, you know, your, your keys, um, your, your coins, um, you know, self custody, that's really, really hard technically. And we, we don't, we, meaning the whole, like no, no one in the world really knows how to scale that yet. Lightning is our, our best attempt right now. Um, and lightning absolutely will scale Bitcoin by at least two or three orders of magnitude over on chain Bitcoin, uh, the Bitcoin protocol itself. Um, and so, you know, we chose to work on Lightning because of that. We believe in Bitcoin as payments. It's the best technology to retain Bitcoin's characteristics while facilitating instant, cheap uh, payments with a great UX. Uh, and there's a lot of work to do, uh, especially around non-custodial mobile applications, which have been underserved with Lightning technology that, that exists. And so that's what that's why we chose LDK, and that's what we've been focusing on now for for over three years. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, Matt O'Dell tweeted recently something like the mental burden of using Lightning in a sovereign way is exhausting compared to on-chain Bitcoin. Managing Lightning nodes makes me appreciate Bitcoin so much more. I think you guys quote tweeted that and said on it, uh, but I, I thought that was a great, uh, great framing for this for this challenge. It, I mean, and he's he's exactly right. Um, Lightning is tremendously more complicated than than Bitcoin itself. It's it's uh, it is a, is a it's a complicated protocol. Um, and it, it is, it's to a point now where the user experience for lightning is pretty darn good if you're using a custodial wallet, but non-custodial still remains a, a, a big, uh, big hurdle. There are some examples like the Phoenix wallet, uh, on mobile, which is non-custodial and it's, it's a pretty good user experience. Um, they've done a really good job with that product. Um, but if you if you compare it to like an an Apple Pay or a, a Visa credit card or or Square or Cash App or Venmo any any um, sort of modern fintech solutions, there's still gaps on the user experience. And I'm a firm believer we we can close those gaps. We can even exceed the user experience of existing technology, and have all the benefits of Bitcoin behind it. And Bitcoin is money. So when we've seen, you know, it feels like there's been a, a total flurry of of lightning development over, you know, call it the last year, especially. A lot of that is in this sort of more custodial realm, right? These are these are projects that are, you know, building out better infrastructure, but still kind of, you know, not not fully getting the 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 true kind of peer to peer decentralized version. Is that is that accurate? That that's accurate. Um, like I, I think Cash App and Wallet of Satoshi are two really popular. Um, Lightning wallets, and they're both they're both custodial, and you know they so they do they do offer pretty good user experience, and people are using them, adopting them. Uh, there's not a lot of hurdles, but but they're custodial. Um, and then for people who have um, started using Nostra and dif- different Nostra clients, um, one one thing that excites that early adopter crowd for Nostra is this um, feature called Zaps, which. You know, um, there's one Nostra client called Domus. It's a Twitter-like experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and in addition to like being able to like a, a post or a tweet um, or a note, um, you can you can zap it, which just simply means it's it's like a microtransaction. So like if you if you post something that I find compelling or want to promote, you know, I can I can zap it. I can zap it a hundred satoshis or or a hundred thousand satoshis or any any amount I want. And it's um, it's not a perfect user experience yet, but it's it's pretty slick. Um, so the, it is seeing usage, and it's just fun to have like a P two dish and experimentation platform of using Bitcoin as money, introducing new people who maybe didn't even own Bitcoin before or know much about it, but they like that experience. Um, that's all great. But the so it's very good that that's happening. Um, but the technology behind those zaps is using LNURL, um, it, it, which is a, a technology to facilitate payments. Um, it has a number of benefits to it, including enabling this use case people are liking. But it also um, it 
you know, it's used, it, it's basically only works with custodial solutions un unless a user hosts their own LNURL server themselves. But, you know, so again, if you're, if you're like a, a, a techie or a hobbyist, maybe you do that, but for norm, normal users, um, it's only going to work custodially. But the good news is there's solutions in the works. Uh, a lot, you know, a lot of it, you know, spirals working on, but there's other, other organizations, um, working on, uh, being able to facilitate all these great user experiences, scaling, et cetera, but do it in a as self-sovereign way as possible. It sounds like the emergence of Nostra in particular, but this sort of set of things that are bringing people into contact with Lightning specifically and Bitcoin more broadly are um, both great from the standpoint of, of kind of driving new people in and, and creating more energy and excitement around the space, but also reinforcing the, the sort of goals that you had already had in terms of, uh, of wanting to have this other set of non-custodial solutions in place so that those, those, these new experiences that people are having and are creating aren't default custodial just by virtue of what's available. Yeah, I agree with that. And, and, you know, someone did the analysis on, on zaps, uh, and it was 95% of them are from custodial wallets, so that's I, that's not really where we want to where we want to be. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm personally I'm not anti custodial wallets. I think it's totally sure. fine to have custodial wallets. They're just simply trade offs. But if Bitcoin evolves where non custodial wallets are are just too hard to use experience for people to use, um, and there's like this massive widening gap. Uh, in user experience, um, then that that's not healthy for Bitcoin, and pretty much. Everyone using Bitcoin then would use custodial, and uh, I I think that's it's at minimum it's a world in which Bitcoin is we don't really realize most of the benefits of Bitcoin, and, and arguably it would be the death of Bitcoin lo long term um, because if everything's custodial, I think it would just like um, result in just a few global custodians, um, sure. which are easy choke points. So yep. I, I think I'm a I'm a strong believer, firm believer in. We need to do everything in our power to work on the technology and the design to make to close the gap on non-custodial um, experiences and get as many people using it as possible and, and making it a realistic option, even for those that are using custodial, that they can gravitate towards or transition to non-custodial without a lot of pain. Yeah, I mean, listen, I, 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 I wholeheartedly agree. And I also think that you know, it's not hard to kind of watch the last few months of uh, U.S. regulatory engagement with the wider crypto sector and have even more of an instinct to push things towards sort of non-custodial uh, <laughs> solutions. You know, it, it, even even if the even if the, the the sites haven't been set on Bitcoin currently, I think it's you know there's there's plenty to be nervous about. What, what, one insight I've gained over time, like several years ago, I thought. That um, I mean, what I just said, I feel I've felt for a long time now about the importance of non-custodial. But I thought the demand would come from end users, and I realized that, um, or like a lot of Americans at least probably don't go through life right now thinking that that's important. So, so I thought the demand would come like from other countries or, or people in, in different situations. But it might take a long time for that demand. But the insight I've gained. I think that demand actually can also come from services themselves. So there, there's because there'll be services that want to enable Bitcoin payments, but they don't themselves want to be a, a, a Bitcoin custodian or be regulated by the government. Mm -hmm. And so for them to enable Bitcoin services without being regulated, they'll, they'll want to support non-custodial Bitcoin and not not custody people's funds. So I think there'll be a lot of services out there that will be heavily investing in the technology and doing those upgrades to support non-custodial to avoid regulatory burden. Yeah, I, I think that that's, that's a really good insight. And it's actually sort of a very positive, uh, almost like unexpectedly positive force where, you know, we're so used to middlemen who want to capture more value in the middle that um, it sort of it requires a little bit of mental rewiring to understand why there would be incentives, holding aside principles, just incentives for not wanting to, <laughs> to, to sort of exist in the middle other than facilitation. But I, I think that that certainly the way that a lot of these, uh, the regulations look like they're getting written in the, in the sort of the debates when they get down into the technicals of it, there's going to be a major difference in the compliance around, you know, sanctions and AML and all that sort of stuff. You know, right. if, you're, if you're taking possession of, of that Bitcoin or not. 
That's right. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the some of the specific things that you guys are working on uh, with the lighting development kit. Um, I mean, it's, it's a ton of things. <laughs> you know, just like going through. Uh, there's there's big big uh, graphics that people can check out that that show all the things. But you know, some of the ones that I've noticed you guys talking about a lot lately are uh, are are sort of Node Mobile, making it easier to set up nodes. I've heard a lot about async payments. I've heard a lot about Bolt Twelve. So I don't know. You know, we don't have to be super comprehensive, but I'd love to just sort of dig into a few of the a few of the things that are top of mind for you guys and you know what they what they potentially represent for for the lightning space sure yeah and we just we published a roadmap re recently that people can go check out it's it's on the the website for ldk is lightningdevkit.org if you go there um you can find the roadmap post and, and read all, all these details they are they're quite technical they're quite in the weeds but I'll try to I'll try to bridge it to like what it actually means, you know, what it's trying to improve and how an end user would be impacted by it. Um, let's see. Let's start with you mentioned um, LDK Node, which we just announced. Um, so let me first start by describing what LDK is. LDK Lightning Development Kit. It it's a full Lightning implementation, which is, as I mentioned earlier is a very complicated protocol. There's four primary Lightning implementations in the space. And you know each of those implementations has taken dozens of engineering years to to be built. Um, you know the number of engineers in these projects range from four to seven, and it's taken each of them four plus years to mature to where they are today. And none of them are even close to being finished. There's still a lot of improvements being made. You know the LDK roadmap is 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 an example of that, but each of the implementations has their own roadmaps and priorities. So it's a lot of work, um, and uh, okay. So the different you know I was describing LDK. How does it differ from the other Lightning implementations? The other Lightning implementations they come in a form of of, of a binary, a software application that you can just download as a user, whether you're a business or a hobbyist or individual user. You can download and run their software. It's all packaged up into a complete application. LDK is not that. LDK is intended for developers, and it's an extensive uh, API for developers with almost a thousand functions in the API. So it gives developers really fine grained control over how to build a Lightning wallet or a Lightning node. Um, so that's a big difference between LDK and the other Lightning implementations is giving that control and flexibility mm -hmm. to create custom applications. So that's great, but it is much more complicated to, to use um, than just you know running software out of the box. So there's a there's a bigger barrier there. What we've observed with LDK is that developers who already have experience building on Lightning and really know what they how they want to customize, they love LDK because they've been seeking that power and flexibility, and it gives them exactly what they need. However, developers who um, are first time adding Lightning to their Bitcoin wallet or to a Bitcoin application, they, they, you know, they've sort of, they, they've felt LDK is too complicated. So enter LDK node. What LDK node is, it builds on top of LDK. It uses the LDK API, and it's its own Lightning wallet and implement uh, and, and lightning node implementation. So you can think of LDK as like this um, unopinionated tool tool set for lightning and LDK node is an in, is an opinionated implementation. Mm -hmm. It's a specific recipe. Um, and it's one that is much easier to get started with. Um, and and we've we've already seen that. We did a a workshop at advancing bitcoin in London last month and there were 30 developers who attended and within one hour, all 30 developers were able to um, send a lightning payment writing code from scratch using mm -hmm. LDK nodes. Cool. So it was much easier to use. Whereas what we've seen with LDK, any any serious product that's building on LDK typically takes one or two engineers like around six months to build that application integrate LDK. So it's just a it's just a it's a more extensive process. But if you're building if you're building like, you know, something that you uh, something really important or differentiated in this space, uh, it's worth that investment. Um, but LDK node will make it much easier to, to get started, 
So you can start it with LDK and Lightning, and for some applications, it'll work great. You can actually launch in production. So you can build a, your, your application super quickly. You can add your specialty and secret sauce on top of it and go ahead and launch. Some, some projects, though, will realize, oh, and when they're in the middle of development, we actually need the power of LDK, mm -hmm. and then they might transition to using the LDK API. So that's what LDK Node is. So it, it helps developers, but yep. what it'll mean for end users, hopefully, is that there'll be many more uh, Bitcoin and Lightning applications available, and we're gonna have a lot more experiments out there and really figure out what are the use cases and um, you know, what are the best uh, user experiences for, for people. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Bolt, you mentioned Bolt 12 and async payments. Both of those are um, improvements to uh, payment protocols. So Bolt 11 is the existing payment protocol that every Lightning wallet supports. If anyone's used Lightning before and scanned a QR code or seen some super long string <laughs> of characters that's a Lightning invoice, that's that's Bolt probably Bolt 11. Uh, it could be LN URL as well. There's a variety of different payment protocols out there with different characteristics. We keep trying to improve them. You know, we we learn from mistakes in the past or drawbacks and keep trying to improve them. Bolt 12 and ASIC payments are a bunch of uh, a bunch of improvements. Um, they're still in development. So by June of this year, we should see Bolt 12 available in the Lightning implementation so then it'd be ready for wallets to start adopting. But it will take time for wallets to adopt and because it has a strong interoperability effect. Like if my wallet supports it and yours doesn't, we can't use Bolt 12 or async payments to, to, to pay each other. Now, what are, you know, I'll try to highlight some of the benefits to these protocols. I'll start with async payments. It, the benefit's quite straightforward. Um, pro a big problem with mobile phones is that they can um, sometimes be offline. Or, or by that, I mean the operating system like iOS might not schedule an application on that phone to run in the background. So if I want to pay you and you have a mobile wallet on your iPhone, then um, unlike on-chain Bitcoin with Lightning, your wallet has to actually sign the transaction as well as me. To, mm -hmm. to, for you to get paid. So um, that means your app on your phone has to run. And if your phone's in your pocket and you're just going on about your day, you'd like to be able to receive the payment from me still. Like let's say I'm zapping you on <laughs> Nostra or however I'm paying you, you want to be able to receive that money without having to like interact with your phone. Um, so that's a big problem on mobile because the, the, again, the, OS, the mobile OS might not schedule the application. Async payments is a protocol that will make that reliable. It'll guarantee that you will actually get paid. Um, I mean, it's a bit complicated how it works, but th that's the benefit of it. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, there's many benefits to Bolt 12, but one example is it, it delivers um, reusable QR codes or um, they're called offers, but they're re reusable. A problem with Bolt, Bolt 11 um, is that when I create a lightning invoice, you can pay it once, but you can't pay it again. So if someone wants a, a tip jar or do donations or to configure, say, their Nostra client to say, here's how I want to be zapped, those are with the problem with Bolt 11 is it's, a, it's only a one time use. But with Bolt 12 offers, you can reuse that over and over again, not lose privacy, unlike on chain uh, Bitcoin addresses. And um, and so it facilitates a lot of use cases that people want to use Bitcoin for. It sounds like I mean uh, the common thread of of the, the these two especially is you had used a phrase before, basically keeping keeping the experience in sync with what consumers expect. And these are sort of behaviors that you just sort of expect, right? If you're if you're interacting with money to be able to yeah. be paid asynchronously, you know, and 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 things like that. So I, it, I think it makes it, sense to to spend time there. Yeah, exactly. I mean, normally, if you if anyone who's used Venmo or Cash App or anything like that, like if, if we have dinner and, and we split the bill and I have to pay you back, uh, and like maybe I hop, hop in my car and I pay you, like it's just I expect that you get paid, and it doesn't matter whether you're pulling out your phone and interacting with it at the same time I am. It, it shouldn't require that. Yeah. Um, 
Well, that's awesome. I, I mean, I, I love hearing about this stuff. I think it's it's really uh, exciting to see. Um, I guess as we sort of start to turn the corner here and and wrap up a little bit, you know, uh, you you you've been doing this with Spiral for four years. You know, longer uh, kind of in general. Um, you know, twenty twenty three. We came into this year sort of rough feeling for many parts of uh, of sort of the broader. Uh, crypto space, if not Bitcoin specifically, but there has also been so much excitement around Bitcoin specifically. You know, what? How, how do you kind of? What's your sense of you know where things are this year? What the feel is? What the vibe is? What the energy around sort of you know uh, builders in the Lightning community is? You know, as compared to call it April of 2022 or April of 2021, even you know what what's changed and you know what what's the state of things right now? I think um, the state of things are are great overall. Uh, the, the the good news about things like Terra Luna and Voyager and Celsius and um, 3AC, FTX, all the debacles from last year, they pretty they pretty much don't impact people building on 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 Bitcoin. It because that that's really just like a completely another world. Um, mm-hmm. it, it generally speaking. Um, those situations, those companies didn't have similar philosophy or alignment with what open source Bitcoin developers or, or even companies that are Bitcoin aligned. Um, so it, it really didn't have any direct negative impact. Um, the only impact really would be just the overall sort of bear market from the past year and a half or so, you know, puts uh, organizations and companies and donors uh, in in more difficult financial situations. So that can mean cutbacks on funding open source development. Um, fortunately, Spiral has um, been continued to increase our budget. So we have not impact, been impacted, but but other organizations have. So I think that's the main negative, um, the main negative impact, at least for, for people um, building building on Bitcoin. But in t- I, I think the the belief in Bitcoin and just reinforcement of why we're working on Bitcoin has never been stronger. And if you just look at like whether it be um, situations in other countries with hyperinflation or how the the banking system or or um, or governments are are reacting, like in in Lebanon, for example, or even in the U.S. with the recent bank runs and bank situations. Um, just a lot of reinforcement there. I know anecdotally, many of my friends who never really understood, who, who owned Bitcoin, but they never understood self-custody. They never thought that it would become um, more than just like sort of a few niche nerds. Uh, and they never dedicated the time to do it. They're all now doing it. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. They've seen enough risk out there uh, and they've strengthened their own belief in Bitcoin. And, and these pe- are people who they, they understand Bitcoin, but they're not working in it full time. Right? I mean, they have other, other priorities in life, um, but they have now all motiv- been motivated and moved to, to self-custody. I, I can't imagine that. Um, all right. You know, I, I've got to believe that's that's more widespread after things like FTX, when people thought they bought Bitcoin and FTX and they actually, they didn't, <laughs> you know, they, they get, they sent the money, but there actually is no Bitcoin behind it. Um, and so I think those are actually powerful marketing, very powerful marketing for, for Bitcoin. Yeah. I mean, listen, then, I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, just last thing I was going to say is th- the reality though, it's, it is hard to manage. It is hard to self custody. Um, you know, if, if you have like 20 bucks, 50 bucks in a spending wallet, okay. It, it's not that, that hard, but you know, if if you put like forty thousand dollars or like a significant part of your portfolio or life savings or whatever you're in that situation, it's um it can be still be a bit nerve wracking to do to do self custody. Um, but the good news there is there are there continues to be progress on that front. More and more products and open source projects in the space that make that experience better. Um, I'm particularly excited about the the wallet that Block is my, my company is actually working on. It's not it's not part of Spar- Spiral. It's not what we do, but there is a commercial project within Block um, in which they're they're building a hardware um, module. But it's but the wallet comes as a two of three multi sig, um, and it's they really are nailing it on user experience for normal people. <laughs> um, so like the fact that it's two of three and all the nerdy stuff on, on the inside is really hidden away nicely from the end user, but they, they, they're, they're going to be offering a very resilient solution for people. 
Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, also speaking to the, you know, one of the things you started with is the, the need for design and design thinking in in the space, like finding the right line for um, sort of obfuscating what's going on under the hood while still making sure that people understand enough of what's going on under the hood such that they can, you know, interact with it is a really difficult challenge. You know, that's not a, <laughs> it's not a simple yeah. thing. It's very difficult. Um, I personally like the trade-offs th that project and that team are making. Um, it'll certainly invite, I mean, and they've been quite transparent too. They, they've been posting like roughly monthly posts explaining the evolution and some of their design decisions. It'll definitely invite scrutiny and criticism from hardcore Bitcoiners. Like there's no display on the hardware device, for example. And um, there, it's it's uh, you don't write down your seed words um, that you're that's abstracted from from the user. So those kind of decisions are going to create an instant reaction from some people in Bitcoin, um, including myself, who very cares very much about <laughs> self sovereignty and and self custody. But I think they're going to have enough escape hatches, and I know that there's enough. Um, strong security thinking and design behind it, that it's going to be a really good solution for a huge portion of the market that would absolutely never do a DIY solution themselves and try yep. to manage, manage seed words. Um, so yeah, I'm excited for that product. And, you know, hopefully it's really successful, brings a lot of people who are on Binance or Coinbase or exchanges and, and has them self custody with confidence and then invite competition. And, you know, hopefully there's a lot of other products come out of the market that, that, um, meet and exceed that bar. Yep. Love it. So, okay. So let's, let's, uh, let's, let's kind of close where we started a little bit. Um, you know, I, I think, like I said, I, you know, I see so much energy surrounding this and, you know, the, the experience of your friends watching not just what happened in crypto, but even people thinking that their money was theirs in banks and then it not being <laughs> as accessible as they thought, uh, you know, over the last couple of months is certainly driving people to explore or want to get deeper into Bitcoin. Um, a lot of those folks aren't, you know, going to be applying for a spiral grant anytime soon necessarily. But you talked about recruiting. Uh, a particular type of of kind of role. I'd love to let's 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 end on sort of, you know, what you're looking for or what what that pitch is. I guess uh, you know just to, to get people's gears turning as they as they kind of head off into the rest of their day. Yeah, actually, a group of people who are non coders but want to help projects just created a new community called the Bitcoin Product Community, and. Um, that's something that anyone interested in, it, you know, if you're interested in volunteering or contributing to Bitcoin, but you're not a coder or don't want to code, um, it's a great community to check out, learn from others. Um, earlier in the show, yeah, I mentioned a specific role that I'm starting to speak about more just to see if there's a special someone or someone's out there to help out with the Bitcoin core project. Now, this particular role, I'd say, has the highest bar of any roles <laughs> to engage with. So, um, like, I'm almost going to, you know, my plan is to, like, almost scare people away from this role because it's so hard. Because you need to have a multi-year mindset to just mm -hmm. get in a position to assist. But I don't want to scare away everyone else from all the other ways to contribute to Bitcoin. Because there's actually dozens of open source projects that are impactful and important to Bitcoin and the most most of which don't have a high, you know, or I mean, you know, are are approachable to to help with and instantly get some wins under your belt right away. So I'd welcome everyone to check out the Bitcoin product community. Know that you um, can add value, and this can be in you know one hour a week volunteering. It could be dedicating three straight months of your life, or it could be a life lifelong endeavor. It can be any of the above. Um, you know, do get involved. Know that you don't have to be an engineer to, to add value. Um, and you don't need to be from a certain area of the world. You don't have to have worked in big tech. Um, you know, anyone can 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 add value, value, value to these projects. Bitcoin Core is specifically, though, is probably going to be someone who is quite technical, super persistent, high EQ skills and people skills. And and um, and really all these all these projects, but in particular, Bitcoin Core, having a deep appreciation for decentralization of Bitcoin overall, 
but also the importance of decentralization in the Bitcoin Core project. And it's, you know, there is strong, for very good reasons, and I'm so happy it is, there's strong resistance to anyone <laughs> trying to control it or centralize it. Um, so anyone trying to help out, I mean, whether you're a developer or non-developer, uh, you have to go in with the right uh, attitude. Awesome. Well, Steve, really appreciate uh, you spending time here today and all, all the work contributing to this space uh, and excited to see how, you know, the rest of this year proceeds as, as, uh, as more building happens on Bitcoin. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Have a good day.